Let me pursue this further by quoting the important Christian philosopher Alvin Plantinga. Plantinga, who is a leader of the Reformed epistemological movement, draws attention to an important similarity between what Thomas Reed said concerning belief-forming mechanisms that make knowledge of the world possible and what Reformed thinkers like John Calvin said about belief in God. Here's the quote from Plantinga. Reformed theologians, as Calvin, have held that God has implanted in us a tendency to accept belief in God under certain conditions. Calvin speaks in this connection of a sense of deity, a sensus divinitatis, inscribed in the hearts of all men. Just as we have a natural tendency to form perceptual beliefs under certain conditions, so says Calvin, we have a natural tendency to form such beliefs as God is speaking to me, and God has created all of this, or God disapproves of what I've done under certain widely realized conditions. Plantinga shows no reluctance in describing the idea of God as innate. In fact, in a later discussion on the bigger tape, we will see how this view enables contemporary reform thinkers to give what many will see as a new twist to some old arguments for God's existence. Now, with that background, let me go back to this debate in Dallas, Texas, between Dr. Plantinga and Dr. Anthony Flew. The justifiable reason why Plantinga told Flew that he did not have to begin by proving the existence of God to gain warrant and credibility and justification, or pick any other word you want, for his claims about the Christian faith were these. Antony Flew's objection to Plantinga made a fatally flawed presupposition. Flew presupposed the untenable epistemological position known as evidentialism. Now, let me summarize the evidentialist position that Flew presupposed, okay? The argument, the presupposition, the assumptions of the evidentialist go something like this. Premise one, it is irrational to accept theistic belief in the absence of sufficient evidence. It is irrational to believe anything in the absence of sufficient evidence. Premise two, there is insufficient evidence to support belief in God, therefore, belief in God is irrational. Okay? So, if the, the, the basic evidentialist objection to Christian theism is this, unless you first begin proving the existence of God, unless you first begin by offering sufficient evidence for your belief that God exists, your belief that God exists is irrational. Now, many people assume this. Antony Flew assumed it. Many people who actually enter into debates with Christians assume that we have some kind of moral obligation to provide sufficient evidence or proofs for our belief that God exists. But planning a rejected that assumption, rejected that position. That's why he refused to grant Antony Flew's demand that he begin by proving something. Now, actually, Plantinga argues in a variety of writings, there are two fatal flaws in the evidentialist position, two fatal flaws. And if the Christian were to attempt to give the evidentialist what he wants, the Christian would become a participant in those mistakes. Here's the first flaw. Planning a points out that there are countless things that we believe, and believe properly and justifiably and rationally without proof or evidence. As we go through life, 
We are correctly believing all kinds of things when we don't have the first idea, the first idea how to, pr pr how to prove these things. For example, to use examples that I've already given you, we, bel we believe in the existence of other minds. But we have no proof for that, and we don't know how to prove that. We believe that the world continues to exist even when we are not perceiving it. But we don't know how to prove that. Now, if we followed the evidentialist and eliminated from our rational structure all beliefs for which no proof or evidence is supplied, we would lose our right to affirm a large number of important claims that only a fool would question. Some evening, sit down before you go to bed and just begin to write down all of the things that you and I believe, believe properly, believe justifiably, even without proofs. So that's the first objection to evidentialism. Proving something is not a condition for believing, having a proper belief. Life is full of things that we take for granted and take for granted properly without the ability to prove them. So, it is clear that we have a right to believe some things without evidence or proof. Since belief in God turns out to belong to the same family of beliefs, we also have a right to believe in God without supporting evidence or arguments. The second fatal flaw of evidentialism is this. The thesis is self-defeating. The thesis, remember, is it is immoral to believe anything without proof. But now we can ask, where is the proof for the evidentialist's claim? What evidence does the evidentialist, be it, be it uh, Antony Flew or anybody else, what evidence does he provide for his belief that it is immoral to believe anything in the absence of evidence? First, the evidentialist warns his listener against acting immorally with respect to his cognitive activities, but then he turns around and acts immorally himself by advancing a thesis for which he provides no proof or evidence. Either evidentialism is false, or it fails the evidentialist's own test of rationality. If it is false, then believing it is an irrational and immoral act. If it fails the evidentialist tests, then on his own grounds, believing it is an irrational and immoral act. Either way, evidentialism is in big trouble. All right. Now, I hope you see the point. When Antony Flew said, Dr. Plantinga, unless you first begin by proving to me that God exists, I will not pay any attention to anything else you say. And Plantinga said, I don't have to. Why? Because all kinds of beliefs we have are not and cannot be supported by evidence. And your own claim that it is immoral to believe anything without sufficient evidence is logically self-defeating. I, therefore, am not going to participate in this particular procedure.